for a ride. I just moved up to Westchester, New York, and it's a beautiful day. I'm looking out in my rearview mirror and I see some guy in a pickup truck and he's he's tailgating me and I don't know why. I pulled over and he says to me, I have a car just like this at home. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. This is a pretty rare car. I'm Darren Frank and I own a 1969 Iso Grifo, which is an Italian two-seat sports car built in Bresso, Italy. It is a high-performance luxury GT car. They only built 412 of them over a 10-year period from 1965 to 1974, and there are very few of them left. It's a very special car. When people first see my car, they actually have no idea what it is. They either get too close to it <laughs> because they're trying to read the script on the trunk and they don't realize that an I in Italian is a long, pronounced like a long E and that it's Iso Grifo, so they inevitably will mispronounce the name of the car. Or my favorite response is when someone will come up and recognize the car and they'll say, I've never actually seen one of these in person, but when I was a child, I had a Matchbox car that looked just like this. In all cases, at car shows or wherever I'm parked, people will come up to me and they'll thank me for bringing it out so that they could experience it as well. Every year, as a ritual, my father would take myself, my oldest brother, Jamie, and my older brother, Corey, to the New York Auto Show at the Coliseum. And it was something we looked forward to all year because we were all gearheads. When we went in 1966, my father saw a silver Iso Grifo. My brother, Jamie, photographed it. And it made an indelible impression on him. He picked up some sales literature on the car and the next thing we knew, the next business trip he took was to Italy, where he met Piero Rivolta, bought a green Iso Grifo, and had it shipped to New Jersey. And it was a real source of pride for me that my daddy owned something that no one else had. No one else had ever heard of it. We had never seen another one other than at the car show, where he first spotted it. And to have that car in our driveway and in our garage, it imprinted on me. My dad was a very intense guy. He was a drill sergeant in the Army. He drove a uh, radio patrol Jeep beyond the front lines. Tough guy, but a sweet guy and a family guy. And it was difficult to find relaxed time with him, especially as a young child who was very easily intimidated by your father, who was, you know, it. He was a bit of a dilettante. He enjoyed photography and high fidelity and, and other hobbies such as that, but the car was to be used. And we found time to bond over the car. Tragically, I, I lost my father um, in 1970 to lung cancer. And so, somehow in my wiring, um, owning this car is a way of being closer to my father.
ESO was originally called ESO Thermos because they made heating, venting, and air conditioning components. And the, uh, the owner of the company, Renzo Revolta, decided that was a little bit boring. And he wanted to get into something a little more exciting. And he designed a car called the Izetta, which in Italian means the little ESO. Um, that car actually was responsible for saving BMW because BMW was on the rocks and ESO licensed the right to build the Izetta to BMW and BMW built hundreds of thousands of them, paying a royalty for each car to ESO. That gave ESO the capital to do other things and Piero Revolta and his father Renzo always wanted to get into something a little more exciting. So they started to think about sports cars. They got together with Nuccio Bertoni of Bertoni Design. They contracted with Giorgetto Giugiaro. He's famous for cars like the Di Tommaso Mangusta, the Maserati Ghibli, actually the Volkswagen Rabbit, believe it or not. And they hired Giotto Bizzarini who was a brilliant engineer who had recently walked out of Ferrari. He worked at ASA, he designed the Lamborghini V12 engine, and he became a contract engineer and a test driver for ESO to work on their new to be introduced line of GT cars. The first of those cars was the ESO Revolta, which was a true GT, two door, four seater, and what really made this car spectacular and unique and different from everything else that was on the market at the time was that it had the sophistication of a Giugiaro design as well as a Bissarini suspension and platform and it was a monocoque which was unusual at the time but it had the reliability of the Corvette engine and that was really the value proposition for this car but they wanted more and, and Bizzarini encouraged Renzo to build a sports car. And that sports car was the ESO Grifo. ESO, the name of the company. Grifo, which is Italian for griffin, which is that mythological beast that's half lion and half eagle. And the ESO Grifo was to be their halo model. And it was introduced at the Salon at Torino in 1963 alongside a racing version of the ESO Grifo called the A3C. The racing version of the ESO Grifo was first in class at Le Mans two years in a row. The Grifo's design is something that is it's so appealing to me. The body is very voluptuous. It's almost got a Coke bottle shape. And the greenhouse on the car actually sits several inches in from the exterior of the car. So the tops of the doors have a flowing flat surface. It's a continuation of these voluptuous front fenders that flow into the rear fenders in that it, it kind of curves back in again. All handmade, exotic materials all over it. In fact, the, uh, the windshield is asymmetrical because the bucks got worn out, so one side of the windshield is actually an inch shorter than the other side. So it's, it's really a, a very unique car in, in that respect, you know, in this day and age of mass production. Bizzarini saw this project for ESO as the next logical step in the evolution of his last project for Ferrari before he walked out in 1961, and that was the 250 GTO. So for Bizzarini to say, this car is the next step, this is, this is where I intended to go, is really a vote of confidence in, in the mark and, and, and in the car itself. Driving an ESO Grifo is a wonderful experience. With the Grifo, you're in a very comfortable driving position. It's extremely stable. It's very fast. It roars when you put your foot into it. Or it can be very docile when you're driving around town. It makes a mediocre driver look good and a good driver look great. The 
oral qualities of the engine and the Muncie Rock Crusher transmission, the M21, and the sound from the differential, there's just nothing like it. It puts a smile on my face every time I get in it, and yet, with the Grifo, uh, the value proposition, is it stands true 45 years after the design of the car. To find a car in 1965, which is when it first came out, with power windows, full leather interior, air conditioning, um, uh, high performance engine, this was the height of elegance, the height of comfort, and the height of design. This was really the top of the game. I had promised myself I'd find a Grifo for myself by the time I turned 30. When I first purchased my ESO, my Grifo, in 1989, it was somewhat of a bastard car. My best friend John is uh, my riding mechanic and my mechanical guru has taught me that it's okay to get dirt under my fingernails and he and I have really gone through the car over the last 25 years and made sure that every single thing, every feature on this car operates exactly the way that ESO intended it to. I'm out for a ride. I just moved up to Westchester, New York, and it's a beautiful day. I'm looking out my rearview mirror and I see some guy in a pickup truck and he's 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 tailgating me and I don't know why. I pulled over and he says to me, I have a car just like this at home. And I'm thinking, I don't think so. This is a pretty rare car. So he said, I think I know what I have in my garage. And he hands me his number and he drives off. I start to call him. And I, I can't get the guy on the phone. And my wife is like, you gotta leave this guy alone. It's been two months now. You've been calling him every day. He's gonna think you're a stalker. You gotta leave him alone. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna leave a message on his answering machine. And I promise you, Catherine, I will never call him again. So I, I dial his number and I say, it's Darren Frank. The next thing I know, he picks up the phone. He was screening this whole time. He said, are you Elliot Frank's son? Now mind you, this is 1995. And I said, wait a minute. My father died 25 years ago. How would you know my father's name? And Joe said, I told you I have a car just like yours in the garage. I bought your father's car. I drove my car to Joe's house and 
He's got all the contents of his mother's apartment in the garage, all over the car, all around the car. It took us half an hour to dig the car out. And we backed it out of the garage. And it had been the first time that car moved in 17 years. It was still on the original tires, and it still had the original Campagnolo magnesium wheels. And um, what was really incredible for me of that whole experience was when we got the car into the sunlight, and I was able to see into the interior. As I might have mentioned, my father had a number of hobbies. One of them was photography, still photography, and he always carried a tripod and a camera, a Nikon camera, with him wherever he went. And one day when he was driving the Grifo, the tripod, which had a very sharp metal edge on it, had fallen and cut the leather on the passenger side footwell. I looked in the car, there was the gash, sent shivers right up my spine. Joe has had the car since 1969, and he's always said to me that if his son Drew ever didn't want the car, that I'd have first dibs on it. I told my daughter Charlotte that, and Charlotte's face fell immediately. And she said, Daddy, you can never do that. And I said, well, I'd have to sell my car to buy Joe's car. She said, but Daddy, that's where my memories are. My memories are in the red car, not that other car. You can never sell this car. That's where my memories are. We keep Polaroids in the glove box of my daughter as a three-year-old child. And every time we'd go out for a ride, she'd pull the Polaroids out and look at herself in the car. So these are my daughter's memories, and I'm safeguarding them for her. My car is really a unique expression of something that took place in the 1960s that probably will never take place again. It was in, at the intersection of what I consider to be the height of Italian design, where the Italians led the world in terms of car design, and the sophistication of the handling and the power, the precision of that Muncie transmission, the brute force of that Corvette engine. And to have all of that together in one place represents something that won't happen again. But more than anything, it's a connection to my father. It's something that my family and I share. And it's a legacy for my daughter.